joined now by Stuart Tiffany, Gareth Rian, Neil Hello. Arnold. How are you guys? All good. Hello. Great. Good. Hello. Thank you very much for joining me, guys. We're, I think between us, over the last two years, we've had maybe something close to six or seven hours worth of curriculum conversation. So what I tried to do with this was not ask questions you've been asked before. And I don't know how successful I'll be at that, but we'll give it a go because I've had some fantastic conversations with you guys. Um, I'm trying to think if they were all during 2022, but I think Neil, we definitely went back as far as 2021 with, uh, with the first ones. So my first question is how important is the local aspect of curriculum design? Because the local gets quite a lot of attention in conversations about curriculum and I'm interested to know how important you guys think that is. Oh, I, I can nip in first if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Wonderful that also gets me over the slight panic of is my have I selected the right microphone <laughs> which I've done wrong many a time. Um, I, I thought it was a really it was a really interesting uh, place to start and um, I don't know if this is the originator um, of this particular reference. So do correct me if it isn't. But um, I found it on a, a blog by Steve uh, Adcock, and it's the idea of the mirror in the window. Um, and if you haven't heard it, I've just a little extract just to get started. Um, the mirror signifying that all pupils would see themselves in our curriculum, the window representing our ambition to show all pupils the world beyond their immediate experience, um, which I think is a really, it's a really beautiful metaphor in its own right. But it also it can be applied to so many different things. Um, I've used it in terms of thinking about diversity and rep representation. Um, that's where I think it's used kind of most often, but in a locality sense, I think it also is a very useful metaphor to, to consider as a basis because it's really key that children look at their immediate locality because that's their sphere of reference. And given that part of our role as educators is to take them into those varied and multiple worlds of the unknown, the known is a very useful anchor point from which to draw comparisons and expand outwards. So in, in a kind of nutshell of what we want to accomplish with it, I think that's probably a useful, uh, a useful place to start. There was a, a lot of talk about this when the curriculum for Wales was being written. And something I kept coming back to is there being kind of three levels of curriculum in terms of how it's designed and, and what the content should be and in terms of its, its actual focus. Um, and I think that then if you have local, meaning immediate vicinity of the school and where your children live, and then a wider picture, which could be regional or it could be national, especially in maybe a, a smaller country like Wales, and then a global focus. And I think that your curriculum needs to have all of those ideas. Um, when we were having conversations about curriculum for Wales, and there was lots of focus on things like Welsh history and Welsh geography and Welsh culture, I kept on coming back to this idea of well, what is Welsh culture, because if you live on a farm in Brecon or you live in a very diverse area in Cardiff, then your culture is entirely different. And so this idea of there being coal mines and sheep farming and so on, which is often kind of a parody of Welsh culture, that wasn't typical of my childhood at all. And it's not typical of the children that I teach. So I think it's really important. And there's also a big focus right now on um, place-based learning, which is a, a slightly different thing again. But this, this idea of place-based learning is really coming into our curriculum. So I think that it, it, it is a very important part of our curriculum. However, it shouldn't be all our children experience because they must look outside of themselves and outside of their own experiences, even from a very young age, to learn about the wider world. I think a little bit. <laughs> um, I don't... I think finding, I understand completely what I was saying, you know, local, regional, national, and then like global. Um, I don't necessarily think that that means, and I'm not saying this what I was saying, is that that needs to be like a, 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 an equal split of like, oh, your curriculum needs to be like 30, 30, 33% local, 33%, uh, you know, national, 33% global. I think starting the little ones off, you know, keeping it local makes sense. Um, particularly, again, we have children, uh, you know, high deprivation, they don't really get out much. So, you know, their local area isn't actually that well known to them, um, let alone, you know, areas of, you know, um, specific historical interest that you might use to hook them in. Um, my fear with perhaps over uh, going, over doing the, the local element um, is kind of, I guess, comes back to why there was a, a national curriculum in, in the first place, which was if I, uh, 
uh, if I uh, took myself and my non-existent family up to up to Leeds because I've heard there's a really good uh, primary history teacher uh, around that way. Obviously, you know, and if I'm doing this is when my kids are at my non-existent children are in year three and the whole like two years has been local, 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 then obviously they have no prior knowledge of that. So when, uh, you know, you start talking about uh, the Romans in Leeds or the most like, you know, Vikings in Leeds and you're talking about all that prior knowledge that they've had from local area studies from key stage one, you know, these kids are at a disadvantage. Obviously, we're at a point where I think, you know, Social mobility is is quite high. So certainly, kind of in my school anyway, I've never known a school to have such high you know, mobility of pupils. They're actually going so far to extreme the other side and making it kind of really just local. I think can kind of produce some perhaps un, you know, unforeseen circumstances that you don't think about student mobility in that way. That you know um, could put those students on a bit of a bit of a bad thing. I think that's um, I think that's really interesting, um, and that's why I quite like both the mirror and the window, as both are really key and they they do have huge le- levels of importance. Um, if we're talking kind of ancient history in Yorkshire, we're going to York. Leeds is, you know, very much a you know a fly on the wall until we get to industrialisation, but we shan't nerd out too much in that regard. Oh, um, I, I don't think the audience would enjoy that beyond kind of you and I, but we'll see. <laughs> um, the the key thing that I really took from this when I was thinking about what my kind of response to it was I wouldn't I don't think we'd ever try and put a percentile factor on in terms of you know necessarily the value added I can't imagine many if any would want to do that but the the difference when I was listening to um, Matt's talk before about how Neil's trust works in terms of that coherent planning locality is the one thing that jumped out of well how does that enact because within the space of a mile you can have huge variations and that can play such a massive underpinning. So, for instance, the school I taught at last, um, we had uh, Stone Age carved stones in the woods down the road by coincidence. Um, and nobody knew about them because it hadn't been taught. And the reason locality, and I will always argue that it is an important factor, is it allows us to tell those local stories that matter where you are and could so often get missed. One of my favourite uh, facts from the last HA survey d- data, just over 80% of primary schools taught the Great Fire of London in Key Stage 1. <laughs> I don't know why just over 80% of children need to know about a 17th century fire that in no way relates to their kind of sphere of reference. But you can compare it to an event that happened locally that was a fire. So the Bradford City fire is one we tend to compare it to. That happened, I think it was the uh, late 70s or early 80s. So it's that sense of it facilitates something where the children can go, oh, I know about that. You mean there's more to it than my little view of the world? I would I'd pick up on that and add, add to it, really, that exactly what you're talking about there of, of relevance. Um, so often you mentioned diversity earlier. So often when it came to something like Black History Month, and again, there's an argument of it shouldn't be a month. It should be an embedded part of your curriculum that's relevant at all times. So often it comes back to American history. And, and so people are looking at Martin Luther King and different American history, whereas in Cardiff, for instance, where I'm teaching, it's one of the most diverse areas of the UK with a, uh, going back 100 years, 50 different nationalities living within one smaller part of Cardiff. So that is much more relevant to the children's experiences, both now and their parents' and grandparents' experiences. And then they can bring all that into the classroom. So uh, I, I completely agree with what both of you are saying. Neil, there is absolutely, of course, no percentage to this. But the relevance in history and geography and in other, other cultural matters is significant and is important. But we absolutely mustn't keep the children just to their local area. That would be a disaster for any curriculum. I think even going down to what we would call foundation, what you would have as key stage one, even going down to those levels too, we must broaden their horizons and open their minds to what's going on across the world. The thing that I think people find difficult with this, because it's quite often, I mean, there was a post on one of the teacher Facebook groups um, the other day um, about kind of local history and they they were happened to based in Leeds which um I got tagged in strangely enough and they were talking about I want to look at Saltaire which is a UNESCO world heritage site because they were focusing on industrial Leeds but it was but that's kind of the far end of Bradford and it's that balancing act of to what extent do we veer towards you know places like for teaching prehistory Scarra Bray and then thinking about well what does the local evidence um have to say a really useful website that um, I think lots of people will hopefully know about is the uh, portable antiquity scheme 
um, which is where the kind of artifacts that are, that are found, you know, the kind of the treasure hunters um, and the, the digs that are found. Well, what you can do is you can literally Google the things that were found and you can refine it so you can find those archaeological finds in your area. So whilst you can still have that, you know, enormous national picture, you can look and go, don't forget these people were here now in where we live. So it gets over that, um, you know, the history just happened in London because that's you know, where you've got all the national museums. That regional variation is hugely interesting. I guess, obviously, you can then get into, like, local is never defined. <laughs> so, you know, what, what, is, is it like a, a five-minute walk? Is it like, do we put a compass in, just say anything, you know, anything within this five miles? Oh, but we can get onto a local bus, and actually the buses from London could take us from one <laughs> side of London across the river to north. So it's a... I always find that uh, how we actually defining local a really interesting conversation. I can give you a definition if you like. So a colleague of mine, Bev uh, Forrest, um, hugely brilliant on all things locality. And she um, she did a bit of digging. We had to go back to Geoffrey Timmins from the uh, one of, I think it's the earliest national curriculum of 1992, who basically described it in the most varied terms of if it's within your region or closer, you can make a claim at locality. But I like, just for for that regard, I like to use the idea of ripples in a pond um, because it's a really useful one to start with, you know, as close as you can. Because if we're taking children into the unknown, let's not jump all the way outwards until they've got a base level of understanding with something and kind of get their head around. So, you know, start with this street the school is on. You can get huge richness for, you know, the humanities studied in there. Start with the school building, as I imagine, unless it's a new build, you're probably going to get a lot from it. Um, but yeah, ripple outwards as opposed to diving straight into those big sites because those stories are wonderful, um, you know, in all their glory. I've been watching, uh, it's like a, not, not a documentary, but a biopic about the guys who, um, from Berlin, who invented what Google Earth became. I think it was called TerraVision. And essentially it was, it's about their court case with Google. Um, um, but what one of the guys did was he had an art installation where he did, Google essentially television, but it went back through time, and I really want to find out if that still exists because you're talking about you know you start with your street. Well, he was starting with his street in Berlin, and then going back fifty hundred years and stuff using whatever sort of sources he had. You know, I think we talked about it a bit on the this is the great subject knowledge compendium a while ago, Neil, about sites that do that kind of thing. But I, I think that's definitely something I'm gonna gonna go and check out. Yeah, the favourite um, digi maps for schools. I think you can go back to like the eighteen fifties ish. I think when they um, as far back as they go. But um, one of my favourite sites um, is old maps online. <laughs> it's just a site, and it literally is what it is. It's just old maps, really, really old maps. Um, but online, you just browse through them and have a look. And I found a whole wealth of interesting local nuggets. Um, from that as well so matt has uh, i don't know if you see the comments there Stuart. he said that uh, four of the the schools are in the same time but i think um we're looking over time to alternative units for local studies and um, which sort of speaks to your point i think yeah i think uh, I, I i have got that i've just put into the youtube chat the uh, website for the portable antiquities scheme just to annoy shannon a little <laughs> yes, bit more. thank you Stuart. um <laughs> <laughs> Anytime, pleasure. Um, but yeah, I think it's that sense of, you know, I, I loved what Matt was saying about that kind of curriculum, you know, kind of thinking and that, that rich conversation you can have, but never being afraid to tweak it because you know your children. And that's, you know, that's that sense of kind of individuality that we always have to consider alongside that. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and there's also opportunity cost with, because there's so many new things happening at the same time. It's like, you know, I say the four of them are in the same town just you doing that one thing for now is you know, the only option, not the, mm. to make life easier for them going forward, but as I say, in the long run. So definitely some more localish stuff will be definitely quite interesting to look at. And it's really, I think perhaps the more local stuff, and I guess the that's an interesting thought I just had, the more local as well doesn't necessarily mean that your teachers will know about that. Like I, I've done a local history study for us and we're looking at... Um, it turns out in like some awful like grass area, literally opposite our school, it used to be um, like an old Victorian like pleasure garden, and like Queen Victoria visited there. Um, you know, some really interesting stuff that you know, looking at it, you'd think nothing interesting ever happened on that bit of pitch. Um, but it turns out, you know, there was quite a lot. But 
I know none of our teachers are local enough to actually know that. And the only reason that I know that is because I was, as a leader, I'm given the time away from the class to actually go and like research that thing. So yes, all the, you know, the local stories are wonderful, but with that then comes making sure you actually give teachers enough time to actually find that stuff or ensure that you have that expertise in your school who can do that because um, with the greatest one respect in the world, if you go onto many uh, resource sites that kind of offer you kind of off the shelf curriculum, they're not going to have, uh, you know, a six lesson scheme of work about your, uh, your school. <laughs> um, they're more likely to have those national global things. And if you are planning say 24 hours of other lessons in your um, time, then it's, it's, you know, it's quite an ask perhaps to go and find that local a to find that local nugget and b then to think about okay well how do i then what does a scheme of work actually look like based on you know um you know the school's 50 100 150 year history i think what adam said in the chat is interesting as well about every school needing a local history obsessive you'll, you'll find <laughs> the, the, the community of the school as well so people who either live on your street or who are within the parents and grandparents of the school. So using that kind of resource can be really helpful and interesting in those ways. So I know, for instance, uh, we had some building work and we dropped off some kind of chocolates to the local neighbours to say, sorry for the lorries coming back and forth. And that just the guys on the door there were just stopping to say, oh, did you know, did you know, in the 40s, in the 50s, this school? And so just that kind of information then can, can be so interesting to you. And then trying to tap into that community of, of the people who went to the school 30 years ago, 50 years ago, if your school is, is of that kind of age, that can all help as well. But I, I mean, as I'm sure we'll come on to later, the biggest thing about curriculum, of course, is deciding what to put in and what to leave out. But so, so you can't do everything. So you just have to try to say, what exactly do we want the children to learn from this? And what exactly are we going to use this study for? Nice. I mean, I can totally relate. When I moved to Medway uh, or to started teaching to Medway, I had no idea about the history. But Rochester High Street and in particular the Guildhall Museum, if there's a period of history, then they had something that would help you. I mean, Charles Dickens lived in the street in Rochester High Street. You know, you've got Tudor buildings, you've got uh, Victorian buildings and or certainly things that have been around since the Victorian time. I don't know if the Guildhall Museums do that generally, but uh, yeah, it really helped me. And I think we used to go there three times a year, just walk down and look at the, the different aspects of history. So, yeah, so I, I think really interesting responses there. Now, I don't know what the, the, the answer to the next one will be, but there are seemingly regular calls for the inclusion of things like financial literacy, life skills to be included in school curricula. Um, and some of the proposed ideas often already are. You'll see secondary teachers say, oh, we, we all, actually, we already do teach that. Um, to what extent do you think it's the responsibility of schools to include such themes in their curricula? I think there's somebody on Twitter who started to make a list a couple of years ago. I, I wish I could remember now who. So every time something is put in a national newspaper or a local newspaper where it says this must be included in the curriculum, but it was a great list. It was a fascinating list. And it was something like within a year, 80 different things, the national newspapers had said must be included in the national curriculum. So every time there's any kind of um, incident, disaster, national experience, it's always this must be included in the curriculum. So as, as I said just moments ago, really, the hardest bit of curriculum planning is deciding what goes in and what stays out of your local school curriculum. So it's impossible to include everything. So we just have to decide what are the most important things to us? So an, in a primary level, there are certain financial things that we can do and there should be elements, kind of basic elements of that within the curriculum. But should it be things like this calls for talking about mortgage rates and compound interest and so on? Elements of that within our work, very small elements, and maybe you know the importance of financial literacy in terms of saving and so on, but, but not going into great detail. And I think another debate often is about first aid. And if you are going to include first aid in your curriculum, exactly what elements of first aid? Because you could do something like life saving, that all the children kind of enjoy that. They, it, it could be something that they do, knowing how to phone 999, knowing where to go to get help. But we, you know, we can't spend hours and hours on what to do with a broken arm or what to do with the burn, those kind of things. So there, there, there can be elements of those areas, those where we have these calls to include it within our curriculum. But we just... It, you know, going back to Matt earlier, talking about teachers being time, having time being a precious element for them. Well, that's the same for the actual curriculum itself. We have to just be so careful of what we include and then what we leave out. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm going back to GCSE business now, like Neil did before. Opportunity cost. 
you know what benefits does that add a bit of a and what you know what's lost because of that choice um i i quite like the idea of that kind of you know the balancing act of well what does it add versus what it takes away that's my usual port of call with thinking the other thing that i thought was quite interesting from a pri- you know with pr- a primary level is do children have the prerequisite world knowledge in order for it to actually make any form of sense as I don't think I fully understood what mortgage and compound interest, et cetera, was. And I, I, you know, that was after I got my first mortgage because it's hugely <laughs> technical. It's hugely important. So it, to me, it's, it's kind of, if we, it has to be that age appropriate level, which is, you know, I think what Gareth was saying as well. And it's, is it adding value and what's getting cut? The, the first aid and the life saving one, I think if it's going to save a life, that, that has quite a lot of value. But it can just be the stage of, you know, with young children, especially if, well, if you see, so, you know, if something really bad happens, who who do we need to call? And if anybody didn't say Ghostbusters in the chat, I think you need to have a word with yourself. <laughs> um, but do, do you know what I mean? It's that sense of, well, let's think really carefully about which bits are utterly key and achievable because it's that level of achievement. You know, if we set ourselves lofty ambitions, there's huge amounts of work and teaching time that's going to go into that at the expense of something else. Yeah, I think it's Mark Lehane who's put that list together, but I think he put it together um, before he became a SPAD. And so I think it's disappeared now because he deleted a lot of uh, previous Twitter history unless he downloaded it and saved it somewhere. Yeah, just to echo that, obviously, I would be the, I would be against anything where insert event A, which then, you know, a month or two later down the line, you know, caused calls for x to put in the curriculum with literally no thinking time whatsoever um and i honestly i do think a um yeah no one's gonna say that they have lots of time to spare right now i think in teaching uh you know the curriculum subjects and getting through the the breadth and depth of what you know they want to do and so there has to clearly be some thought put into this you know one thing in one thing out like i know um like bsl is quite a popular one to get into uh primary school wouldn't be against it um i don't know any um it's probably easier for a teacher to learn bsl than it probably would be a foreign language maybe i don't know why i think that it instinctively feels that way um but of course if you do that fine but then you know take out mfl as it is and you know just tell us to do one or other don't just kind of have put an additional layer of expectation that it's bsl as well as uh languages um so yeah, a one in one out system I think would be um lovely. And again, I'm sure um you all know you're, you're quite right with the relevance. You know, it's hard enough now teaching money to year one and year two. <laughs> <laughs> and so imagine like, yeah, in the in the um um you know, back in back in the day it'd be like, you know, your parents would give you maybe like a five pound note and you'd stick it in a in a piggy bank and I, I get the impression, you know, I certainly don't carry much cash around with me anymore and I'm getting on a bit I think most of the parents that we have sitting at our school are my age a little bit older perhaps and I imagine most of their stuff was done you know contactlessly and so now at this point it's all you know these prepaid cards and stuff that you can give all like these very precise kids bank accounts things so say it's hard enough teaching some of these things some things that are core content on the curriculum to make it relevant enough and find that in um as it is, which is really interesting because literally yesterday the BBC archive on Twitter tweeted out uh, like a three minute clip about, it must have been about year five, year six children, uh, tweet, uh, just having a discussion about uh, pocket money and what they used to get and talking about, uh, you know, three and 10 and all of that kind of, you know, going back to, yeah, the imperial money and all of that stuff, which went above my head, but yeah, interesting conversation that they clearly knew the value of money in a far greater way than I think we could actually give kids that age now because they were experiencing it you know wages that back then would been probably paid in the envelope etc cetera, etc cetera, not kind of all digitized i also think i meant to say this before it's the idea of if we teach this to children you know in the kind of the age of let's go seven eight mid-range of um is that going to be anywhere near to the world they actually have to deal with when they get to adulthood because in the, you know the this age of digitization um, I do a bit of undergraduate lecturing and I have to convey to the undergraduate students there was a time in teaching before high-speed broadband and iPads. 
you know, when I was at, uh, when I was top of primary school, we were really lucky because in year six we had the school PC. You know, there's one in the whole school. We had um, uh, we had Acon computers. I don't know if people remember those. The Aldi version of Apple Mac, I think. Um, <laughs> and if we teach them now as it is, by the time they get there, that's possibly not going to be relevant at all. And it, to me, it seems better to really hammer in those core fundamentals and focus in on the things that will facilitate future learning. And the more we try and add in, the more kind of tangents we, and reactionary tangents we own, especially, it's not really going to be overly helpful in you know five to 10 years' time, I would imagine. No. I mean, I'm with you. I, I think I must have been halfway through my NQT year before I realized that you needed to write stuff down because your memory wasn't infinite. And, and it's not my school that I look back and shake my fist at. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't say, oh, I wish my teachers had taught me that. <laughs> you know, so... Um, I think most adults will have that that same sort of feeling. So, and I just think there probably is, I don't know, maybe I'll stop me very quickly and go down the tangent, but it seems to be a the, the simple fix to all society A's, to all of society's ails seems to be, yeah, well, schools will fix it. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it, it, you know, let's, let's think about it in a little bit broader sense than that. You know, there is a role for, you know, parents and you know, government agencies, you know, but it's not just... You know, it shouldn't just the first reaction shouldn't just be well, the schools should sort it. I think there's you know, many different avenues that one should explore before you get to uh, pinning the, uh, you know, that 95 theses of things to change on the DFE's door and declarations go out very soon. Now, next one I'm really interested to find out about can a well designed curriculum? act as a vehicle for teacher or teaching development? And if so, how might it do that? I think Matt answered that pretty uh, pretty comprehensively before. Um, the bit I really enjoyed from that was um, when it was originally, you know, we share the planning out, I had a bit of a, almost a, not a scowl, that's far too strong a word, you know, that kind of reservation. There we go, that's better. That reservation of well, how is the intention conveyed? Because um, I, when I've spoken to friends who teach at different schools um, and they were saying they have a system where it is, it, all the planning is done, you pick it up and you teach it in an attempt to ensure consistency. But that that real methodology, that into underpinning intention, that's what can so easily be lost if we're not careful with this, which is why I really loved the collaborative um, Zoom call, Teams call or whichever particular software uh, it happens on. That was that moment of now I get it. And that, to me, is the, the the essence here is in isolation, can a well-designed curriculum act as a vehicle? To me, it would be if there is that supporting thought process, because without that thought process, it's very easy to misunderstand. And if you're teaching, let's say, a block of six lessons and you've misunderstood the first two, that is a heck of a lot of backfilling. Which in, and I think that was the bit that I found really interesting of just let's you know let's look really carefully about well not only do we give them the what but also why and how those two bits I find really useful additions. Yeah, I think that layer of accountability, monitoring. I don't know what the right word for it is, but I can say as I mentioned, I think that's the difference between this and going on to. Uh, into any other resource website where you know everything is done done for you because i think you know instinctively you know you you know you teach a you teach a better lesson even if you spent half the amount of time thinking through it than just kind of whipping it off the the shelf and so it's trying to find that happy medium between well realistically teachers at a one form entry school two form entry school can't do that as well for everyone versus this i think um it seems to be working all right, quite well right now. Um, mm. Narrative arcs are a useful, uh, a really useful way to think about that sequence of lessons. And, you know, as teachers, we are storytelling in many different guises. And if you don't have that narrative arc thought, thought through, and if you didn't plan it yourself, you don't have access to that that sense of arc, then conveying that, it's more difficult. Sorry, well, it's, it's kind of like a, like a really good like box set, you know? If only someone had done an analogy for that. Hmm. They're important the, lessons to know, though. Like the, the ending can't be rubbish, otherwise it just lets down everyone. You know, there are important <laughs> lessons that you need to know. But yeah, that narrative arc is super important. 
I think well-designed curriculum programs can certainly add a lot to the um, to teacher knowledge, though. So, for instance, when I moved schools a couple of years ago, I brought the core knowledge curriculum, so the the US version, the Hirsch version, the core knowledge curriculum, to my new school for uh, teaching of reading. So it's it's it it's called the uh, language arts curriculum, but it's mostly reading and writing with a, a kind of touch of oracy. And the way that the curriculum is written uh, is in such depth that it was teaching teachers things about teaching of reading that they didn't know. And so having not read uh, Chris Such's book at that stage and so on, the curriculum itself and the teacher's planning was helping the teachers to be able to see things that they hadn't seen before in using other programs like Letters and Sounds, Jolly Phonics, those sorts of things. And so even though we've got to a stage now a couple of years in where the teachers are adapting the planning and making it their own, initially, it definitely, they were reporting back to me, it was making them better teachers of reading especially. And I, and I think probably the complete maths curriculum, again, it, it, it's a framework. It's not a complete curriculum in that way. It's a framework. But the pedagogical notes in there, the misconceptions, those kind of things, again, are helping the teachers in terms of the mathematics. Oh, look for this. Or this is a way to think about this. Those kind of things are helping the teachers, I think. So it, it isn't that it's all done for you and the teachers still have to put in a lot of the work. But definitely there are bits that can add to your knowledge and expertise and even how you might approach how you're going to teach the actual pedagogy if the program or the curriculum content is written well. Yeah, and that comes down to then that specificity that uh, Matt talks about. Like there's no, having written a few curriculums like that and have looked at um, like Sarah's as well, like you always learn something new from doing it and that you generally find you know, quite interesting. And like, yeah, I've learned far more about the, <laughs> I can't remember what the phrase in the national curriculum is. I'm sure Stuart told me, like, what was in, supposed to be, like, the narrative, the British Isles or whatever it was. I've learned so much about, like, that narrative from putting these curriculum together. And I've no doubt that, um, you know, teachers, as they go through that, you know, that sentence that they may see in the national curriculum will suddenly make a lot more sense to them. Um, keeping on to history, because we have Stuart here as well, but my sense of chronology um, has gotten so much more better by having this outlined like you know, so clearly, I can kind of really kind of see, yeah, Stone Age, Iron Age, Bronze Age, Celts were around the same time as the Bronze Age, then the um, the Romans then came, and then the Anglo-Saxons came, and then like, the Vikings were kind of like the same time, and then you know, 1066 happened, Norman, like, and for me, that's just, uh, we talk about powerful knowledge, important. Like, I think that is quite important to understand like all those reasons as to why you're here and, how it is that that's all come to be. Like, I think that's intrinsically quite interesting. And I think it's quite powerful that I have that kind of mental model in my head that I can go, oh yeah, uh, don't get me wrong, like you know, bronze, uh, stone age to iron age is like that long. And then, you know, <laughs> then you just have like, you know, a micro bit and a micro bit and a micro bit. But I think it's still, uh, you know, really interesting, really good. And I'd only get that by looking at these kind of curriculums that are, um, coherent that do flow from one another that do um, you know make explicit reference back to things that have happened in the past or not necessarily chronologically in the past but things that you may have studied in the past that may have come before as well etc. The reference point is always really interesting of and I, I think one of the ways in which I've kind of changed my own thinking over the past or oh, I don't know how many years um, it's that I'm not going to presume you remember it but I'm going to use like storytelling devices like callbacks and foreshadowing because it's a really useful thing to kind of, you know, just set things up to go next year, this will make more, you'll have another perspective on this. When you look at concepts like an invasion or a migration, you can look, there's always multiple perspectives. And when we think about the fact that, you know, the, the curriculum history of these islands is a coherent chronological narrative you know, when the Iron Age comes after the Bronze Age, but we won't mention that, that somebody got that wrong a second ago. We wouldn't dream of it. Um, oh, there we go. I mean, somebody had to do it. It, it made me giggle quite a lot. Um, and it's that sense of, once again, it's that sense of, you know, that narrative arc, that story, that storytelling aspect. We've got, you know, stories being psychological privilege is pretty well known, like you'd hope by now. Um, I think the other element to this, uh, just to move on, if that's okay, is to think about that sense of, it's never, you know, it's never necessarily done. 
um, one of my particular favorite kind of models of uh, thinking. It's, uh, and I think I heard Neil mention this on one of the previous podcasts, uh, uh, Kaizen, which is a Japanese uh, business model. So uh, somebody else has mentioned it at some stage. That's fair enough. Um, and it's this idea, um, it's, it's kind of quite often wrongly defined as many small steps but it's this, uh, it translates as kind of good change or almost like continuous improvement. And the idea is when you look at things and go, here's the curriculum as it stands, which bits were really successful and which bits do we think, do you know what, we need to have another look at that. And it's that, it, the reason I really like it is it doesn't attribute blame. It's about everybody having that, you know, all the way, because it's a business model, all the way from like the CEO at the top to the people on the production line going, this bit I think we could make better by doing this and you know having that that investment that staff team investment and uh, that's why you know when um, Matt before was talking about the people working kind of allocating who needs which bit of support that alongside a very um, clearly defined curriculum I think that's what gives you that real strength and power because you know knowledge in isolation is really useful and helpful but continuously renewing it as uh, Christine Council quite often talks about, that's where we get that sense of this is the power and this is how we can continually drive that improvement forward. I know it's not quite the same question, Kieran, but exactly what Stuart and Neil have been saying about the curriculum and so on. I had a really interesting conversation with uh, an inspector, so Estin, our, our vision of Ofsted, and the inspector was saying how pedagogy is the most important thing of all and curriculum is is not as important as pedagogy. And her view is that a really good teacher because they have really good pedagogy will make up for a poor curriculum, but a poor curriculum can't make up uh, a good curriculum. Sorry. Can't make up for poor pedagogy. And I don't ever think that it's either or. Um, so what we're trying to do is build great curriculum. And alongside that, like the double helix thing, we're trying to then also make our teachers excellent in terms of their knowledge of, of pedagogical choices. So what pedagogy would you want for this particular part of how you're teaching time right now with this age of child and, and even with this group of children who you know one thing didn't work for previously? Um, and so making those choices then w would be very different within history or geography or our Eve. So, so having teachers who have pedagogical knowledge across different areas of the curriculum and also have great curriculum content to teach that has been um, put together by people with great knowledge in terms of the content and also in terms of how it all fits in, in a great progression model. So I think what we're hopefully trying to work towards is, is both making great choices, having great content, and then having great pedagogy to be able to deliver it well. Absolutely. I mean, I'm sure I've said a million times before that thinking deeply is not just the name. It's, it's, like, it's like a mantra. You know, I think the bulk of our job as teachers is to think. You know, we're thinking during lessons, we're thinking in advance of lessons and following lessons and anything that can help us to think better and more deeply about things, I think is 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 welcome. Um, you know, so I'm I'm totally with you guys on on this. So I think we've probably got time for one more. We're thinking about 2023. I'd be really interested, Garth, if uh, if you have Wales as the context for your response to this. So maybe we'll start with your your response. What are the biggest challenges facing schools with regards to curriculum implementation in 2023 and how can we overcome them? So what this is a very specific answer really to your question is curriculum for Wales itself. So Neil was saying he hasn't really looked at it much yet. Um, I'm sorry to say that there are quite a few teachers in Wales who haven't looked at it much yet, even though we started this journey back in 2015. There is uh, a huge challenge in terms of trying to figure out not just all the different elements of Curriculum for Wales itself, but what, what it means in terms of the big picture. So trying to say that we have six areas of learning and we have the pedagogical principles and we have our um, cross-curriculum responsibilities uh, and we have all these different elements to the curriculum. How do they all fit together within one school, but then within a cluster of schools? So something to come back to what Neil said earlier about a national curriculum. In Curriculum for Wales, we have around 1,200 schools in Wales, and we're going to have 1,200 curriculums. Uh, that is by design. And so the, the more that schools can work together in, in really efficient and in, in great ways, maybe not quite at the level Matt spoke about earlier, I don't think that's going to be possible within Curriculum for Wales, even within a cluster. But, but the better that we're able to work together to be able to design 
great curriculums that we can then amend and adjust for our schools rather than all starting from scratch and having 1200 different individual curriculums I think the better off we'll all be so that's the biggest challenge is the curriculum for Wales itself which has been statutory um, since September for primary schools and will be for year seven and year eight in secondary schools next year um, but the second element of that has been the biggest challenge for my individual school this year and, and, and again, I'm sure it's across maybe even the whole of the world right now, but still coming back from COVID, um, our reception class in particular are not anywhere close to the level of last year's reception class even, which is really interesting because, of course, those children were still three and four, two, three and four when COVID kind of started. And so we're having to adjust what we thought that we would be teaching with our reception class this year. There is a knock on effect in other year groups, but it's reception in particular within my school where we're finding a huge challenge. And we're having to say all those great things that we were doing last year and the year before, even when we had lockdowns and so on, the majority of the children are not at that level right now. So we're having to take a step back. So things that we might have been doing in nursery in terms of personal and social development, physical development, those kind of things we're doing in reception now. Uh, but at the same time, for those children who maybe have had great experiences with their parents, they still manage to get to childcare, they still manage to go to nursery, making sure we don't hold those children back as well. That's definitely been in terms of one individual school, and I, and I hear this from lots of other heads as well. That's the biggest challenge facing us at the moment. I made myself a list of Go all on, the man. things um that i i could kind of uh come on it's just a list you know the things that kind of jump to your head uh jump jumped into my head sorry um i think the first one is time and, and having the ability to make time at lots of different levels um because in a you know in a kind of a strategic oversight sense if you are an academy that's not part of a trust a free school or an authority school um then the layers of assistance you can draw upon is hugely varied. Um, budgetary constraints, because I mean, I thankfully have never had to deal with that other than you, the history leader is a couple of hundred quid to spend. Um, that is a huge, has huge ramifications, not just in, you know, the kind of the financial sense, but also more importantly in that brain capacity sense of actually having the time to really think deeply about, you know, the education that you're providing the vision um as a person that kind of goes na around england um looking at different school curriculum offers and thinking about the different there is a huge variation in terms of what each either curriculum lead head teacher or academy trust wants from there and it's that variation that really has kind of interesting ramifications and then the other one the, the kind of the the final ones i've collated several of them into one um is the idea of Ofsted's role and the fact that, you know, lots of people are hearing lots of different things about how to please Ofsted and the fact that there are huge kind of contested things based around people getting an external consultant in who claims to know what's going on and then they put their own spin on it. And it's that sense of, you know, that I think what we could do with is a bit more objectivity of these are the markers to hit. And I think if if we can get to the stage where it's that we, we have that moment of going objectively, this is what we're aiming for. These are the criteria. For instance, there was the uh, a, a while ago now, um, the Ofsted training materials leaked. Well, the biggest challenge is schools don't know. And if schools don't know, they're playing a game with an uncertain outcome. And therefore, to me, it seems really logical that if you don't know what you're aiming for in kind of granular, specific details, to quote Matt's curriculum conversation before, well, how do we know we're getting there? And, you know, the counter argument is the fact that, you know, schools have ownership over their curriculum. It's what's right for their pupils to take it back to question one. But I think the biggest challenge is there isn't a huge amount of concrete detail out there that we can reliably say this is what we're going to adjudicate ourselves against. And, you know, if just something that make life easier would be if that were available and done in, a, done in a way that schools go, right, now I get it. That, that to me, would be the biggest kind of benefit. Yeah, linked to that one, um, I was going to say assessments because that seems to be, from the bits and pieces that I hear from the Ofsted murmurings, you know, oh, everything was going really, really well. Um, then they asked us, oh, how do we assess? history, geography, DT, and 
not blank eyes, but clearly the answer isn't the preordained, after dead, accepted answer. Should such should should such a thing exist? Um, I'm sure it doesn't. I don't think does. Ofsted asked that question, Neil. I think it's those who are acting and preparing schools for that kind of situation who ask that question. Might well be. Because um, I've not heard of anyone actually be asked that by an inspector. Well, I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I think it's a, a nasty byproduct um, of a positive understanding of the, the actualities of the, of the the approach. I definitely have heard stories of inspectors asking it, but again, this is where it all comes down to, you know, uh, the difference of an Ofsted inspector and you know, their curriculum materials and training. The Ofsted inspectors clearly aren't as uh, effective as perhaps they could be. Um, so I think there will be... So in terms of curriculum, I'd like to think that there are probably quite a few schools who are at that point now where they have a coherent, structured, granular curriculum. And so the next part of their journey might be like, okay, well, how do we make sure that this uh, uh, here's the intended in, uh, intended curriculum? How do we make sure that's actually uh, being enacted in schools? Um, I think the other biggest concern about curriculum is that once you kind of have these granular things, um, obviously if a child misses it, it, it the detrimental knock-on effect because of that. And again, it's kind of since COVID, we're just finding, you know, SCN provision is just through the roof right now. And so actually, you know, we can't magic another three or four hours in the day where we can kind of give them this pastoral support to kind of help them on that. So they they have they they need that pastoral uh, intervention to kind of help them deal with various issues that I'm sure, you know, we've all experienced that in the past. And so the fact that, you know, we have to take children out of lessons to kind of give them that support that they need because there's nothing uh, out there, you know, uh, you know, CAMS, for example, has been cut to an inch of its life. And so we're having to deal with say, going back to what I said earlier, you know, schooling seeming to be the, uh, the safe, the social safety net for, you know, children's mental health and all of that kind of thing. Um, so I think that's a kind of a massive deal that's going to really impact kind of curriculum carry on going forward to 2024. And then obviously, uh, in all of our cases, obviously, you know, an election is now sooner rather than later. Uh, it seems unlikely that uh, the current government will remain. Uh, the current party won't remain. I don't want to call anything too soon, but obviously should uh, should the Conservatives come out of government, you know, no doubt there will be then more curriculum change to come in 2025 that, you know, we'll have to start thinking about. And because of that potential change, maybe that might mean that some schools will, you know, take their hand off, uh, take their foot off the accelerator a little bit because they know that wider ranging changes is, is potentially coming sooner rather than later. Curriculum for Wales is coming your way, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have no excuse then but to look at it. <laughs> I told the Labour Party are very interested in looking to see what's going on. Oh really? Oh, we, there's there's money to be made here. We need to position ourselves really carefully, right? We'll, I was we'll going to say so clearly. After this, <laughs> whoever's listening to this, if you want, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess maybe, yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe you know they'll hear this and think, oh, maybe we'll get to do it. Neil to write the national textbook of history, <laughs> of primary history for uh, England. That would be good fun. I I'll do the national I... bit. Stuart can go around and then find every do a a page on every local school in uh, <laughs> in England. Start at the top and work your way down. <laughs> or it make sense for you to start at the bottom, wouldn't it, and then work your way up to be nearer your home then. Could call it Curriculum GB. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, wait, that might associate it with the yeah, news channel. Let's not do... No, let's not. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, sorry. GB yeah, Curriculum. <laughs> uh, right, well, we're halfway through. Well, two minutes away from being halfway through this thing. Thank you very much for joining me, guys. I mean, essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take your big challenges and I'm going to invite you back to talk about them during 2023 because, you know, we only scratch the surface and neil i am happy to accept that that those instances have happened and um, i'm just poorly informed you know so yeah, definitely yeah. prefer to your experience thank you very much for joining me guys i really appreciate it thanks Kieran. No at all. Thank, thank you, you. Well done.